All right, everybody, welcome to Raw Men Podcast, episode third, number 32. Tonight we are interviewing Mark Lawrence uh, in Utah, and he's, a, we're gonna, he's part of the, or leader, director of Restore Our Humanity. And before we get to him about that, Mark, did you have any announcements today? I don't. I don't have any <laughs> as of now. Uh, the only... The only thing that I, uh, the only thing that I would say, and I'm still muted. No, I'm hearing you. Oh, okay. The only thing I would say is uh, that Be Secular is running a, a fundraiser right now for ourself, and we've never actually done one just for ourselves. We're just selling uh, color versions of our shirt that had only been available in black up until now, the regular Be Secular logo shirt. Uh, if people go to our Facebook page; they can find the link to that. Um, all the money from that, unlike all of our other charitable events, is going to go directly to the campaign. They're not going to be split up, so we'd appreciate if people go and uh, support that. But I don't have any other announcements. Okay. So, Mr. Lawrence, Restore Our Humanity. Can you explain what that is, please? Uh, Restore Humanity is a small, local, all-volunteer uh, nonprofit here in Salt Lake City. And we originally formed in July of 2012 with the sole intention of overturning Utah's Amendment 3, which was our marriage ban in Utah. Um, after that, uh, that worked out pretty well, so we're kind of still hanging around and doing things here in Utah. All right, and so uh, what is it that you're, you're doing primarily now? Our largest focus right now is taking on uh, an organization called the World Congress of Families, and they are convening here and polluting our state and our city at the end of the month. And uh, the World Congress of Families is a very large organization. They serve as an umbrella organization for some of the most vehemently anti-gay organizations in the world. And uh, we're taking a stand against them, just to let them know that uh, they're not welcome here. Well, they have such a nice, friendly name. I mean, how could you distrust any organization with the name family in it? Well, every organization that has the name family in it is a hate group. <laughs> Coincidentally, yes. yes. <laughs> so it seems. Okay, so what's, what, what, you said that the, the World Congress of Families is an umbrella organization for a number of other hate groups. Do you, yes. do you have, any other, uh, have any other names of these? Sure, there's Andy. Uh, there's the Alliance Defending Freedom, which is probably one of the worst and one of the most well-funded. There's the National Organization for Marriage, uh, Concerns to Pated Women for America. Concerns um, to what? Concerns to pay, Concerned Women for America. Some of us call them Concerns to Pated. Uh, Family Research Council, um, the Family Endeavor or the Endeavor Forum. Uh, there's about a dozen of them, and these are all the top-level the most vehemently and the most powerful and influential anti-gay hate groups in the nation. And they it are all like, they're all partners. It seems like the uh, the groups that have the word family in them a lot of times are, are code for anti-gay. Yes, yes. That's something that became popular in, uh, in, in the 70s. All of a sudden it became, uh, and, and the World Congress of Families was influential in this, it, it became the, uh, the code word to fight gay people because gay people are against family. We don't, of course, have families. Right. So, yes, you're absolutely right. If something says family in it, that's them. Yeah, well, I noticed this when I went to the, I went to the Southern Poverty Law Center's uh, website and I just looked up all the, you know, how many of these different groups had the word family in them. And, mm -hmm. of course, the, the, the anti-gay agenda was a common bond between all of them. That, the fact that they are exclusively religious. Yes. And I've well, always, had the, I've always had the opinion, and I, I, I wish that the Founding Fathers had had the foresight to see this, that, you know, regardless, you can have all the freedom of religion that you want, but if you want to evoke a reason for something, if, re if religion is the reason, then you don't have a reason. You need to have a, a reason separate from your religious beliefs. You have to have something that justifies the reason for your your position or for whatever it is that you, you want to take action on yeah. and uh, otherwise you can't get any support or or justification in that you know you, you should have a safe you should have a secular reason for whatever you want to do and and I think that would that requirement would uh, would negate an awful lot of what you know religious organizations get away with 
It, it could, or it could uh, empower them to come up with even more tools and more skills to work around that. I mean, to me, uh, religion is nothing more than an excuse for bad behavior. And anybody can use religion and wrap themselves in religious bigotry to excuse their behavior. Uh, these kind of organizations that we're talking about here, they all wrap themselves up in, in, uh, in the religious blanket. And it, it's difficult to argue that with them. Yeah, and I, I know people that are, you know, because I live in Texas, you know, we, we have lots of people in this area that in my immediate vicinity who are, you know, the, the extreme religious right. And, that, and I, I ask, what difference does it make to you whether other people get married. I mean, how do, how is that an infringement on your rights? And the the answer that I got was that they needed, you know, it was you know, from these Christians was that they needed to impose their edicts onto other people who don't believe the same thing as they do. Right. And if they can't impose those edicts onto other people, onto the non-believers, then that is somehow an an oppression of the Christians. Right. So literally translated, that means that their, their inability to oppress other people is the oppression they experience. Exactly, and that's attacking their freedom of religion, yes. Um, they're Which staging is, a lot of things you see, like the Kim Davis episode. That's all staged uh, by the Liberty uh, Council. And they will start using these and blowing these all out of proportion uh, to use this as an excuse to secure their so-called religious liberties and religious rights. And to anybody who's actually looking at it, you can see the whole thing is just, it's, it's put on and it's staged and it's not real. But it does draw in those people who are weak enough and the people who have to hang on to those, uh, those religious beliefs. And that's how they manipulate people. Well, I'm a little mystified as to why anybody would hold on to religious beliefs. I so am I. It. Especially some of I have actually met a few people who are pretty smart. They hang on to that, especially this predominant religion here in Utah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the shit that they believe in. And so is it? So you have this uh, this World Congress of Families, and they're doing something specific to Utah. What is what is the specific issue to Utah that they're doing? Uh, every couple of years, they have a world conference. They've been doing this since 1997. Uh, the World Congress of Families is actually the excrement of an organization called the Howard Center in Rockford, Illinois. And uh, one of the directors of the Howard Center, his name was Alan Carson, was called to Russia in 1997 to help them discuss their problems with negative population growth. So they all gathered together and decided that negative population growth is due to homosexuality and women's reproductive rights. So this kind of became the, the focal point of their, their battle cry. Okay, so at, the, at, the risk of, of, at the risk of sounding eugenic, we're in a population that is currently over 7.3 billion people. Right. And climbing at an exponential rate. Right. And Russia has an enormous percentage of orphanages and homeless kids. Yeah. So when my grandmother was born, the world population since her birth, she was, she was born in 1900, mm -hmm. uh, and, and since her birth, the world population had doubled. And that, that number had doubled again. Uh -huh. And now we're seeing it doubling again. Yes. So this is the, the, the number of people on the planet, which at the point that she was born in 1900, there was more people alive then than had ever been alive before in the history of the earth. Right. And so within one lifetime, it doubles and then doubles again. Yes. So we went from, from one and a half billion to three billion about the point that I was born and then it was six billion and now we're at 7.3. Right. And so why would there be a concern about negative population growth? Shouldn't that be like a goal? Only to a good, right-thinking, uh, normal person, yes. Yes, it would be. But these people are not right-thinking. These people don't have uh, any way of justifying their, their thinking. As far as they're concerned, the only purpose for the human being is breeding stock. You know, they, they've broken down human beings into the same thing as a cockroach. All they do is eat and breathe. Uh, and that's what they think is going to save society, is if everybody breathes and that's it. Well, I mean, what, what about, like, quality of life? 
I mean, I mean, like bearing in mind that these are not the last days, which is the most wonderful excuse you could ever come up with to justify completely atrocious, irresponsible behavior. Right. But one of the one of the examples that 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 I know from firsthand experience is, I mean, there was somebody had offered me a job in one of these uh, Alaskan fisheries once upon a time when I was a when I was a young man, and and they paid a huge amount of money to go up there for like five months. You could solve all your debts in five months. Of working in, in these, you know, in dangerous conditions, but you you would you would still make enough money that it would justify the trip. You wouldn't you would have wouldn't have to work when you came home. Right, my you nephew know, did that. You you could do that for off the rest of the year, right. and you'd still be able to support yourself. And a lot of people did that. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that they were sending out more ships, more fishing and crabbing boats every year, and bringing in collectively. Even though they're sending out more ships, all those ships together are bringing in less fish. What is the inevitable mathematic conclusion of that? <laughs> it would be really interesting to ask them that and see what their response is. So but what they started doing was they, they started cutting off the industry every other year, so they would only allow this you know, these, these certain companies to do their fishing, and then they shut them off the next year. They can only do it like an even-numbered years or so, and they, they started doing this in 1992, thereabouts. Mm -hmm. and I don't know if they've maintained that, but, I mean, this is this is what they were telling me at the time. It's like so the gas shortage. Yeah. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't, I don't understand the, the idea of hoping that the world is about to end. Because when you talk to these people, I mean, very often they, they don't get excited or happy about anything unless they think that the world is about to end. That's the only thing they ever get excited about. Right. That's the only thing that brings them joy, right. which is one of the things that I find is Christian or Islamic dominionism, either either type, it doesn't matter. When you really want the world to end, when you when you declare all these prophecies, and and so what you're doing is you're you're wiping out all of the natural resources. And a lot of people like Ann Coulter say that this is what you're supposed to do. That the biblical right. way is the gas guzzling SUV, with the wet bar. That you're supposed to rape the planet. I believe that's was what, the exact words that she used. That's what the LDS uh, Church says. They, the planet is here for us, and it's here for our use. Yeah, and, and so there's there's no accountability at all. There's no right. there, there there's no realization that there's going to be a change, or that the planet will even still exist after you know when when our children and our you know our when our grandchildren, our literal grandchildren, the children of our current children, what have you, aren't going to have the resources that we do because we used them all up being asshole idiots. Right. Right. I, it's, a, it's a little bit bizarre to me that we will throw away a reality in favor of a fantasy that allows us to exploit and destroy wholesale. I mean, I, I don't, I've always been kind of environmentalist. I've always seen that, you know, if you have these natural resources, you have like oil that you can use for both fuel and plastics, and you've had it here for, you know, millions of years, and now we're going to use all of it up. Right. In two centuries. Yeah. And then what if we need to make plastic after that? You know, it, we, we have jets. Jets are really efficient, wonderful ways of travel. So uh, they use the same kind of fuel, that the, the same resource for fuel that automobiles do. So why don't we have electric cars? Because we could use using electric cars, but we can't make an electric jet. <laughs> The, the jet has to use the fuel. So why would we use up all of the fuel that we know that we're going to need for the jets later? Why do we use it up for all the cars now? Right, right. Because it's so, it's so exceedingly myopic. It's so unrealistic. It's so stupid. But I think the attitude with a lot of these ultra-right-wing conservatives is that if there's anything that the progressives like, they're going to automatically hate it with no reason with no logic. I mean, they, these people define cognitive dissonance. And uh, they will be opposed to anything just because somebody is, is in support of something without giving it any kind of thought. These people live back in the 1950s. Uh, if, you, if you look really hard at these people who are particularly running the World Congress of Families, these people literally live in the 1950s. And that's what they want to see again, and that's what they want to bring things back to. These are not forward-thinking progressive people. These are backwards people. 
Yeah, a lot of people don't realize what you know what what conservative means means you know holding on to the good old days. Exactly. Even though there were no good old days, and I, yeah. I, I'm ridiculed all the time for thinking that things are getting better and better, you know, and and yeah. because you know the crime rate is getting worse and worse all the time, and then you look statistically, it's not. Right. Actually, the direct opposite is happening. We have less crime, better situation, steadily progressively and you know despite all these all these horrific efforts the worst things I ever hear in the news are almost always something some church did or some religious whack job did you know like you know yesterday for example when when this uh, this couple had all their kids taken away because they killed two of them in a church kicking and beating them for hours trying to get them to admit to certain sins right right or just to admit, confess sins so that they would be saved. Well, here here in Utah, the largest uh, homeless uh, teenagers population, the LGBT homeless kids, nearly 70% of them are LDS. And the LDS church is infamous for throwing their kids out when they come out as gay. And it's all done in the name of that religion, and it's all done in, in the name of their Jesus. And now it doesn't make sense. There are a lot of really interesting splinter groups that are starting up within the LDS church now. That uh, There's a lot of activity going on uh, and a lot of support for the LGBT kids now. And I imagine the old men up in the big building downtown are, uh, are pretty freaked out about it. The old men in the big building downtown? Yeah, the, uh, the church hierarchy. The uh, the apostles, the twelve, whatever they are. I I don't really understand the church hierarchy, but I know that they have a lot of problems on their hands now because there are a lot of factions factions coming up inside the church uh, that are causing them some problems and making them stop and look at it. Yeah, well, there's one of the problems of not having this something that is based on reason or evidence because. What ends up invariably happening is that when you get one story being told by the guy who made it up, then you get other versions of that story and other adaptations. So they all shard into new, new religions, new denominations, new cults, and so forth. Right. And everything is heretical because there's there's no orthodoxy to you know every, everything is based on something else, and there's no way to know or yeah. show which is the true way if there ever was one. And of course, I doubt that there ever was. Right. But when you don't have a way of showing who's right and who's wrong, then if there's no way to tell at all, other by other than by your assertion of conviction, which of course only only butts heads with their assertion of conviction, mm -hmm. then you're in an impasse for every disagreement. And so hatred and animosity have to rise because there's no choice, because there's no reason, because there's no way to know. I, a, a friend of mine. A dear friend of mine in high school is now a fundamentalist church leader, runs a Christian school where they teach creationism as the and, and the Bible is the only source of truth in the world. And I had a few hours of, of talking with him in his, in his office. I said, well, what do you mean? let's imagine that we have, we have a, that there is a God, right? And so we have all these different religions. So let's, let's take a dozen different guys, representative of all these different religious groups. We just get a pie graph, see which is the largest blocks. We take a representative from each of these groups. Each of these people is claiming to have the absolute truth. So let's all gather them together. So we have your, your Hindu of your various types, and your Muslims of various types, and Christians of various types, and so forth. And you have them all around this table, and let's work out what is really true about what any of them believe so that we can determine which is the right religion and which is the right denomination of that religion. And my friend said they would never do that. And I said, why not? He says, I can't tell you. <laughs> that was just mystifying. And the, the reason I would suspect why he would say that is because on some level, I think they all know it's pretend. Yeah, on some level they do, and they're so scared to be, they don't want anybody rocking the boat. They're comfortable with their little lives, and they're comfortable living in their little narrow, uh, narrow-minded existence, being told what to think and what to do, and there are a lot of people that are that way, and we are a threat to them. They don't want to have their little world shook up. Okay, when you say we... Uh, which demographic are you identifying? Uh, as well? Progressives who have uh, walked away from religion, from Christianity, from those beliefs, and people who are actually looking forward and uh, 
don't allow ourselves to, to be told who to believe and what to believe by foolish old men. Foolish old men yes. uh, who can't provide a reason. Right, right. Anything. And they, they, they can't answer the questions. They they always answer these questions with, well, this is what I believe. And then uh, yeah, and I, I, I've, said, I've said many times throughout my life, you know, I don't care what you believe. Mm -hmm. All I care is why you believe it. And whether I should believe it too, because if it's if it's a reason why I should believe it too, then it's a reason why you should believe it. But if you if we you know, if you can't give a reason for me, then I don't think you have one for yourself. That's a, that's a good point. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The reasons I believe what I believe would be believed too. Yeah. yeah. I don't I don't necessarily even care what a person believes or why they believe it. I care about what they do with that belief. Like I don't care. If they believe that if they're not good to everybody, a ten foot guy is going to come by and cut their head off. If that's making them do good shit, I'm okay with it. Well, yeah, I, I have a little bit different perspective on that. I mean, it's it's not when when people are talking about you know their, their beliefs. I mean, very often they'll they'll say, "Well, well, I believe." Well, I don't care. Tell me what the tell me what the reason is. Tell me what the evidence is. See, if, let me know if it's compelling. You know, but but just people asserting their belief as if that alone, the fact that you believe X period, means that it's some kind of justification. The fact that you believe it is the justification, because that's what it is for all these people. Yeah, it's justification exactly. Yeah, I, I can I can make up all kinds of stuff, and just as long as I profess it as a belief, then our culture is conditioned to somehow nod and accept that. Right. So what is this, uh, the council, that, what, what are they doing and what are you doing about it? Okay, um, what they do is they have these big conferences all over the world about every two years. And this is the first one that they have actually had in the United States. They kind of work like the Olympics do. They have cities bid to have their conference. And an organization here in Salt Lake City called the Sutherland Institute bid on their, uh, their conferences here and they won the bid. Uh, an old friend of ours here named Paul Mara, who was the former director of uh, Southern Institute, actually is one of the founders of the World Congress of Families, so he's buddies with all of them. Uh, right after he did that, they fired him at the Sutherland Institute. So the Southern Institute is kind of stuck with this event now. Uh, what they do is they bring in people from all over the world. Uh, they call them leaders and scholars and religious leaders, political leaders, and they have a big, huge three-day conference. Um, the I point think, of the conference being to bitch and moan that yes. gays exist? They claim that, that the primary focus for their conventions and their conference is to protect and to promote what they call the natural family. And what this does is actually, the way they put this message out is, is it's oppressive and offensive to anybody who doesn't fit into this tiny little narrow perspective. They're actually attacking single parent families. Uh, multi-generational families, interracial families, not just LGBT families, they're going after anybody who doesn't fit into their little bucket, their narrow little perspective of 1950s Leave it to Beaver. Yeah. <laughs> and they claim to be protecting the natural family, but the only people that are attacking the natural family is them. Uh, but they do seem to, uh, they oppress a lot of other families. Any family that doesn't fit in their definition, they are against. And they gather all of these little groups together and these people together to come up with ways of, of uh, promoting what they call the natural family. So it's not just that they're an anti-LGBT group, uh, they're an anti-family group and they're very anti-social. So we take the Leave it to Beaver family mm -hmm. and we take that, uh, I can't even remember their names now, but the, 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 the Leave it to Beaver couple. Uh, are divorced, uh, remarried, and now they have new kids with new spouses, and they also have old kids with old spouses living with them, as well as the uh, as well as the grandparents, perhaps in the house. Right. Uh, these are the this is the unconventional family that, that they want to get away from. That, that is not a natural family, and that is not, according to them, best for kids. Okay. What about the Lucille the uh, Lucille Ball show? No. No. That would not be a natural family for them. The natural family for them would be, oh, father knows best. <laughs> uh, you know. 
These okay. people have just, they, they, claim, they claim that this definition, that they pulled the definition of the natural family from the 1948 um, United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. Now, we have to keep in mind that in 1948, blacks could not ride in the front seat of the bus. This was before the civil rights movement, and this yeah, is yes, what they claim. We're talking about the good old days when only white, Christian, heterosexual men had mm -hmm. rights. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what they promote, and that's what they want to see. Um, the I did a second... presentation on this uh, at Imagine No Religion a couple of years back, uh -huh. where I showed you know, the, the Mayberry RFD. <laughs> and how a lot of people want to go back to this kind of ideal situation, except that if you look at all of the actors in the picture, you know they're they're all like uh, uh, they're all activists now. They're all like uh, liberal, Democrat, progressive, gay. Yeah. You know, <laughs> these are the very people, the very cast of Mayberry RFD. Right. But if you look at Mayberry RFD, I mean, most of the men were single. There was the drunk guy. The barber was single. And he, the sheriff was single. Uh, there were no traditional families in that show. <laughs> yeah, and, and then there was uh, Gomer, the big surprise. Right. Gay. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and he played the mechanic. Yes. Not a typically gay role. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is not. Um, or a Marine, because he also played that in the same character. <laughs> exactly. Um, it, it's really kind of hard to try to understand these people and try to understand where it is they're coming from and why they're doing this. I don't know what their fear is. They're afraid. They're scared to death. They're, they're scared of anything that falls outside of what they believe everything should be. See, the first time I ever had a conversation about environmentalism with, with a, a Christian group, I remember saying, that, okay, so they, they, were, they were upset that I, I'm saying that we should conserve resources and that we shouldn't have all the kids that we should have. And, and you know, I'm thinking when I, when, I, when I suggest, you know, responsible reproduction, mm -hmm. this was like taken as being criminal. Oh, right? yes. For, for some reason, it's perfectly acceptable to take a child and risk slicing its penis off by cutting off the foreskin that you don't need to cut off. There's no justification for it except for some ridiculous book of old fables that have been proven wrong in every testable claim that they make. Right. That's perfectly fine. But while all, while at the same time complaining about um, compla complaining about uh, uh, unwanted pregnancies and the, and the birth rate and, and abortions and all of these, it's not okay to take that same baby and instead of cutting off the foreskin, do a, re a reversible vasectomy. That is a horrific criminal idea that only some kind of Nazi eugenist could mm -hmm. ever come up with. Right. And I came up with that idea as a little boy because I was understanding that, they, okay, look at the population growth, look at the available resources, look at how cities are spreading, look at what just what the existence of roads crisscrossing throughout the environment is doing to migration patterns and so forth. How We can't maintain any kind of biodiversity this way. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, You have to be some kind of a real extreme left uh, evolutionist to understand that, evolu that, that, that biodiversity even has importance right. in the environment. You know? And I'm, I'm, I'm aghast that other people don't get this. That you, know, you look at the, lo the courtship period of a lobster, it's like a 12-year uh, thing. So when you're hauling in boats full of these things to feed 7 billion people, and there's a, re the restaurant, there's a restaurant not far from us that does the incredible crab. And I went, I went in there with, with a couple of friends. We ate like 11 pounds of crab. But then I realized, okay, we're, we're eating all this crab, and so is everybody else, and they have restaurants like this in every city. How many crabs are we consuming? Daily, right? You know, and and they go into all these uh, stores like the the, the Asian markets, especially. I, you know, I have e Asian family, and um, you go into the, the 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 fish area, and you look at all of the fish on ice, and you wonder how many. This is just one store. Yeah, you know, in one town, in one state, and so forth. How many fish are in every store everywhere that we're pulling in every single day? Right, and and you know they're not keeping these, so you know it's. Right. It's not like a really efficient system where there will be no waste. Right. There's fantastic waste. So yeah. it's it's not it's not realistic. It's not sustainable, and it 
I don't know. It's like being on a train when you know there's the tracks running out and you've, you've got you, you, and you're just speeding up. Right. Yeah. And, I, I, and I'm sorry. And then we have these people that are just they they're not going to look at anything like that. They can't. They they, they don't have the uh, the intelligence to face something like that. So they're just going to automatically write you off as being evil and you're wrong and you're bad because they're scared. They don't want to face it. Um, so I had this conversation with these uh, these Christians when I said, okay, so if you're right, and you, you 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 then Jesus will come back, and he will only save you from your own myopic foolishness, <laughs> as you have way too damn many kids, and none of them have proper medication or food, and all the resources are gone, and everybody's starving, and he comes to save you literally from yourselves, whereas. If I'm right, you know, then Jesus it wouldn't come back at all. But it wouldn't matter, even if he did come back. He would, and he wants to destroy the world. The world is a perfectly good world. There's no reason to destroy it. Everybody has the resources that they need. There's not quite so many people, but the people that we have are happier and well taken care of. Mm -hmm. And everybody has a more fulfilled life. So I mean, I asked the question. So, so what if you're wrong? And the answer immediately, before I could even get out the hypothetical, was, "I'm not wrong." Yeah, okay, but what if you're wrong? I'm not wrong. Okay, so you, you can't even think hypothetically. I'm not wrong. Right. Yeah. It's it's it's, it's got to be this. There's a weird defense mechanism going on there. Yeah. There it is. is not like somebody that has evidence or a reason to back their position. And that's, yeah. and that's why I say on some level they have to know that they're, they're trying to assert another reality, to assume another reality, that if they believe hard enough, mm -hmm. they can make that other reality happen. Or if they, even if that other reality doesn't happen, as long as they can convince themselves that it's real, then it doesn't matter. Well, that's cognitive dissonance again. You know, uh, the, the, the evidence is there, but they can't accept it, and they will not accept it. One of the things that I, uh, I will hit an LDS, a good LDS person with here in Salt Lake City is, is the money and the wealth that that organization has. They just built like a six billion dollar mall right across the street from their temple. Three blocks to the east of that is a homeless shelter with families and kids standing out in the streets with drug, drug uh, sellers. And they just ignore that. For the money they spent on that mall they could have put these people in homes. And you ask them about that. I say, why does your Jesus want to have a Tiffany's instead of feeding these kids? And they say, they, they respond, with, our church does all kinds of, of humanitarian things all over the world. Well, there was a Bloomberg report a while back that says their church spends 0.07% of its wealth and its income on humanitarian causes. The rest of the money, they're building malls, they build churches, they build temples, and they consume and you ask them about that, and they can't answer it. Um, that's how I see them. Okay, so this this World Congress, what are they likely to do in your state? Uh, they're going to be bringing in a lot of people, a lot of speakers, and we have identified quite a few of the speakers who will be speaking here in Salt Lake City who are some of the top anti-LGBT leaders in the country. A woman named Dr. Janice Krauss is the head of the World Congress of Families. She was one of the original founders of Concerned Women for America, and she has been writing gay bashing for years. Um, Brian Brown, the head of the National Organization for Marriage, his only purpose for existence, the only uh, reason the National Organization for Marriage exists is they're professional gay bashers. Jennifer Roback Morse, Mark Regnerus, you know who he is, right? No, I don't. He is the one who wrote a study that all of the conservative organizations try to use to prove that children are better in a home with a mom and a dad. And he has been laughed out of every, well, nobody has ever taken him seriously. His study has been thrown out of court after court. Uh, it's just a big joke. The, the regular study is a big joke. But the these conservatives keep hanging on to that. They're bringing him in. Uh, a man named Peter Sprigg who is a, a major anti-gay bigot. I mean, this, these people, like I said, the only reason that they exist is to fight against gay rights and gay people and to oppress gay people. Archbishop Cordelione from San Francisco, he was one of the authors of Proposition 8. Uh, so all of these people are coming here, yet they are trying to convince us that this is not going to be an anti-gay or an anti-anything uh, uh, conference. 
but just putting it into perspective, these people that I have named and these organizations that I have named to us in the LGBT community are exactly the same as the Aryan Nations, the Ku Klux Klan, anti-Semitic organizations. They are hate groups. Every single one of them is listed as a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center. And they are to us, to our families, our friends, and our allies, a hate group. Now, if you were to replace these organizations with the Ku Klux Klan, with the Aryan Nation, there would be no question whatsoever as to what this group's intentions are. But the fact that these are all anti-LGBT organizations and hate groups, that makes it okay. That makes it so that the LDS Church and even our governor are welcoming them here in our state and with open arms. But how, do you, how do you know that your governor is welcoming them with open arms? What he's, indication do you have of that? Speaking, he's listed as one of their speakers, and he has come out and publicly open, uh, made a statement that he's welcoming them. We're actually circulating a petition now, and we're going to hold a rally up at the state capitol next week and demand that he back away from that. Uh, because it's an offense to us. It's no different to us than if it was the KKK rally. And if it were a KKK rally, this state would be up in arms. Nobody would put up with it. But simply because these organizations are anti-LGBT hate groups, they're welcome. And that's wrong. And we're going to call them out on that. Yeah, well, you know, homosexuality is just a choice. You can be cured of that, right? Yeah. <laughs> I remember the day I made the choice. I think it was in May of 1972. It was uh, May 23rd, 7 o'clock in the morning. I woke up and went, hey, I think I'll be gay. Very good. I saw a man in uh, in his 80s, and he had he was holding this sign up wearing a rainbow shirt. He says, you know, 85 years gay, but it's just a phase. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yes. So I, 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 one of the other things, that one of the unreal aspects of this, I mean, is that you can see pictures in nature of you know homosexual lions and, and homosexual dogs and, and and that sort of thing. I mean, where they're exclusively so. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I'm very. For example, I had a I had a gay dog. He had, he had sex with every every male dog or cat that we had, but he wouldn't touch any of the females. <laughs> <laughs> Very clearly a gay dog. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you know, gay people have been around since the beginning of, of history. Socrates was gay. You know, it, I didn't know that, but... Uh, yeah. we, gay, homosexuality did not become a problem in society until the Christians made it so. It has existed in every single culture everywhere since the beginning of time. I know what I think is funny is that when you talk to when you talk of course they have absolutely no concept of evolution or how it works right. until they start bashing gays. <laughs> then suddenly they get the idea that you know that the gays don't don't reproduce homosexuality. Just because you're gay doesn't mean you can't you can't reproduce the gay gene. Or whatever into your offspring, so they they think that well we'll just herd them up in a concentration camp as John Hagee once suggested. Yes. that gays and atheists should be herded into a concentration camp until we die out. But yeah. the thing that they're missing is since the since they're not neither of us neither of our demographics are being generated by any evolutionary mechanism. No. Right, it's so, them that makes us. They're the ones who make <laughs> us. <laughs> because if it if it was, we wouldn't be having gay lions and dogs right. and, <laughs> and penguins. <laughs> and penguins. These things wouldn't be happening. So this this the, this fluctuation in you know sexual orientation may well be, and this is my own personal hypothesis. No justification behind it. I fully admit. Uh, but my suspicion is that the, the tendency toward homosexuality may be a population response. Like a, we've known that, uh, like some stickleback fish switch back and forth between sexual and asexual reproduction. Mm -hmm. Well, and there are there are just as I said in Jurassic Park, you know, there are like certain populations of frogs that will be in a single sex environment can actually switch switch sexes mm -hmm. when when there is a disproportionate balance. I think maybe there are population level controls like that. Maybe homosexuality is one of those mathematical algorithms that just tends to show up more often when the population expands to a certain point. I, I actually do think it's a kind of a population algorithm that it could be calculated that way. Obviously, it's not dependent on a single gene. 
or anything like that, but you know, the more people you have, the more likely pretend propensity you're going to have to have more gay people. Right. And maybe this is a kind of a, con a population control. I don't know. It's just a suspicion that I have that I that I pos that I speculate. That wow, makes sense. Um, I, I I I absolutely believe that it's natural and that, that uh, it's been around since the beginning of, of civilization. Uh, the records go back. Uh, we consider quote all kinds of people in history who have been gay, but it's not necessary. I don't think we have to justify ourselves genetically. Yeah, somebody We're, was telling me a couple of days ago how how they were told that everybody has you know marriage equality. Uh, they, everybody has the same right to marry someone of the opposite sex. Right. Yeah, that was one of the tired old arguments from the battle. Yeah, they tried that here in Utah when we were fighting uh, with Kitchen v. Herbert. Uh, they tried that argument and it didn't fly either. Well, so what do you uh, what do you expect as a result of all this? Uh, my biggest goal right now is just to get Governor Herbert, our governor, to back out of this conference. That uh, that would be big, and that would be something that I would consider a big achievement. We would like to get the LDS Church to back out. Uh, and then go ahead and let them have their conference. Um, How do you get the LDS Church to back out? Well, they don't need another big PR scandal on their hands, and they're about to get one. But that's but that's what they're all about. They've established themselves mm -hmm. as being gay haters. Yes, they have. They have. And, and they've and, got a long history of this. This is not going to surprise anybody. Right, but they are trying pretty hard right now to back down away from that. They have... Uh, They've slowed down their rhetoric a little bit. We've seen some changes in their rhetoric, and they're trying to be more opening and affirmative, they claim. They now say that they believe that gay people were born that way, and so they have to welcome gay people into their church, but gay people have to remain celibate. They cannot act on those feelings. That's their new stance now, and that's progress for them. Uh, and I think that it also has to do with all these, like I said, splinter groups that are that are coming up inside the Mormon Church that are demanding that the church back down on all this. Now, somewhere in Africa, there is a large church that has recently announced that they have they, that they're allowing gay clergy in yes. Africa. In Africa, yes. Which which I thought was huge. And then when I was in the Netherlands a few months ago, I passed by a small church that that said uh, that had in a window a sign that that said uh, my I had to have somebody translate it for me. Uh, you know, my clergy marries gays. Okay. That's the Netherlands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and it's funny when it, I've did a lot of traveling this last year, and everywhere I went to, embarrassingly, was more progressive than my own country. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Northern the Europe. Yes. Cycle the way that they're energy conscious, the way that they generate power versus the way they consume power, the way that yeah. everything from you know, food, from understanding of practically everything. Yes. So I mean, I come home, the best damn country there is, and all I get is <laughs> America. It's 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 really genuinely embarrassing. Yes, it is. So, I mean, this, we, is, this is coming from somebody that was raised to be proud of my country. Because we were the leader in technology, we were the leader in innovation, we were the producers, we were the, the inventors, we, you know, we, we were the most educated nation on earth. Right. And, and that is not, consumers. that is not the reputation we have now. No. We're the consumers now, and that's it. Yeah. And we, yep. yeah, we become something of, of sheep, and we don't even understand the, the technology that we're addicted to. Right. And so all we are doing is breeding like rabbits. We're shortening our lifespan, actually, because everybody having – it's been estimated that if you, uh, you throw, if you get everybody to not get pregnant until you're like 20, 25, as opposed to 15. Right. If, if everybody did that for like 80 generations, then you would have a substantially increased longevity of the human population that we would live considerably longer – just from that small change, yeah, it's one of the you know one of the evolutionary laws that put in place. But of course, they don't want to accept anything like that. No, 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 they, so they won't. They won't. We just need to bring more souls to the Lord, and then we need to have a negative feedback loop so that we mm -hmm. don't teach anything about sex ed, and we don't allow uh, either abortions or birth control, either right. one. Right. So, and then we, we won't have any education, and then we won't have any social welfare programs for all of the unwanted kids 
we made by being so ignorant. That's right. It's it's a little bewildering. Which is it, one of the reasons that I wanted to do this show was so that I could talk to people that are actually taking action and they're trying to fix things in the world around them that are recognizing that there is a problem and that something should be done about it. Yeah. So you want to just get the, the governor to back off of this. You're, you're not going to get the, the, the DLDS. No, the other they're, churches, they're not going to back off, but if we could just stir up some attention from within their church, because I think that the LDS church is going through a big transition right now. They have got all of these groups. They've got uh, ordained women now who are screaming. They want to be ordained. Uh, like I said, a lot of LGBT groups, they have a lot of splinter groups that are rising up inside the church right now. And if we continue to get those people activated, we keep talking to those people, then we might start seeing some positive changes in well, the now, that, church. Yeah, now there you've got something. I mean, because I mean, you've got, the, the biggest mystery to me is how you have black members of the LDS. Uh -huh. Because when I was 14, and, I, and you know, my family brought over the Mormon missionaries to talk to me, they gave me the whole Mark of Cain thing. Right. You know, how he's supposed to have, you know, black skin so that he could be recognized as this is the mark of the devil and and all of the ridiculous storyline that goes attached to that. And so that's why there were no blacks allowed in the LDS. Right. In in the early nineteen seventies. No, I think it was like seventy eight or thereabouts. Yeah, it was around like there, yes. It was re immediately after they talked to me. It was like within a year or so of that of, of the mm -hmm. time that I talked to because it was still blacks still couldn't get in and I and that should have been right around nineteen seventy seven. So I'm guessing it was nineteen seventy eight when they made that change. Yes. So how do you, how, how could a black man, or even weirder, a black woman decide they want to be Mormon? That one is beyond me. I'll tell you, we have a, uh, a black Utah state senator here in Utah, one of our local state senators, who's very staunch LDS. And we just last year passed uh, a statewide non-discrimination ordinance known as SB 296, which uh, provides non-discrimination for LGBT people in jobs and in housing. And this guy's name is Jackson, came out against it. And he said, I am very offended by how the LGBT community has hijacked the civil rights movement. <laughs> and, and he used his church, the LDS church, as a weapon to attack the LGBT community. And I just thought that is absolutely ironic. <laughs> that is just wrong. The man just blew me away. Uh, but they're, I, it's just brainwashing. They're, they're just, they're brainwashed. Uh, I can't understand it. How can a black man be a member of that church? Um, well, here's another question. What about, what about Native Americans? You know, Native Americans in the LDS, do they uh, get some benefit of claiming Jewish ancestry? Um, Ooh, good question. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, that's a really good question. I don't know if the LDS people actually go that far back to claim that they are Jewish, but I guess they would since that's where. Yeah, even though you know, like any kind of evidence that's ever been found has been shown that you know the, that these people are not <laughs> are not descended from Jews. You know, <laughs> It, it, there's I, I forget the the actual tribes like there there are some in in Northeast Asia and uh, I think even in Japan that have a strong genetic link to the entire influx of Native Americans in North America and most in, in South America as well. Mm -hmm. But no indication at all and quite quite a bit of refutation against the idea of being Jewish. They they did not come over from Israel in mm -hmm. submarines. <laughs> with magic rocks lighting the way. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't bring chariots, no horses. No. Can you imagine South America, pre-Columbian South America, tr somebody trying to, to drive a chariot through the Amazon? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even want to picture that. Um, I know that the LDS Church has these uh, tour groups that they take down to South America to, to the Aztec uh, and the Mayan ruins that are supposed to prove their their Book of Mormon. And I don't know, maybe someday I could go on one just to see what it's about. Yeah, though, I saw an interesting thing because you know I, I had Mormon family too, and they showed me all these uh, all these things that they were declaring as evidence from South America. All these you know weird rocks or whatever that they interpret as meaning something about you know their Jewish ancestry and all that. Uh -huh. But the arguments that they use are perilously similar to some arguments that I've heard from Muslims also referring 
you know, their rocks and weird sites, and that the, the weird justifications that both groups come up with are very, very similar. It's like a, you know, almost like mirror image of each other. Right. Each claiming how each one is proven by this or that artifact, right. or this or that, this or that bizarre coincidence. You know, yeah. If you fudge the math just a little bit, then if you draw a line from this mosque to this mosque, that line will directly overline this other mosque. If, <laughs> if, if, if it's on a Tuesday, <laughs> if, as if that mattered, even if even if you didn't have to fudge the math. Right. So what? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know that the, the LDS Church recently released photographs of the magic rocks that Joseph Smith used to translate uh, the Book of Mormon. Uh, and that was big news here, yeah. But I'll tell you, we saw some of the funniest memes coming up on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> well, give me an idea. Give me an idea. Uh, I, I have an, idea. an idea is one guy put a, uh, a, a rock up, a, a picture of a rock with two eyes on it and this little cracked smile, and, and everybody started <laughs> gathering their own versions of the magic rocks. I'll have to send you some of them. They're very, very funny. But the, okay. the, the church actually expects people, they expect normal people to believe, to believe that this rock that they took a picture of was magic, and it was the rock that Joseph Smith used to translate the Book of Mormon. And the fact that people believe that crap is just staggering to me. Okay, so in, in this discussion, we, you know, we, we haven't talked very much about this World Congress or what they've been doing. Mm -hmm. We talked a lot about environmentalism. Right. about you know, the religious rights attacks on homosexuality and how un unfounded that is, how eugenic it seems to be to offer any kind of responsible reproduction or uh, how evil it would be to be conservative with our resources or any of that. Mm -hmm. just, just how stupid intelligence is in general. Right. So, so getting back to the topic that we were supposed to be talking about, I mean, normally when you don't have this conference, you mean you're still... You know, the, the Restore Our Humanity still has a function beyond that, right? Yes. What do you yes. normally do? Um, we're one of the first organizations that has applied for a Boy Scouts charter under the new uh, rules with the Boy Scouts of America. Now we you have not heard familiarize me with the new rules of the Boy the Scouts. New rules, um, Dr. Gates came out and, and convinced the Boy Scouts of America that they've got to stop this exclusionary policy of not allowing gay leaders, gay Boy Scout leaders in the organization. So they're working on that now. So we have but won't even vex the other kids with the gay gene. No. <laughs> <laughs> what we're doing, though, what we're, what, we're, agenda. what we're trying to do, though, is we don't want this. This is not going to be a gay scout troop. This is going to be an opening, welcoming, and affirmative troop for all. There are some. Well, the LDS Church runs 97% of the scout troops in Utah, in the state of Utah. They have 97%. So we have a huge underserved population of young men who could benefit greatly from the scouting program, especially in some of our poorer areas. And that's our goal, is to open up the scouting to begin an all-inclusive, secular, non-religious scouting troop. Now, let me ask you about that, because, I mean, the mm -hmm. joke that I just made about, you know, the, the, the threat of homosexuals... Mm -hmm. As scout leaders meant that they were going to indoctrinate children into the homosexual agenda, as if that's even a thing that could be imagined to be real. Right, and it also feeds into the mythology that gay people are pedophiles, and uh, that's a lie. And that's what people keep building on, building on, and adding to it. Pedophilia is a is a disease that is primarily in the heterosexual community. Jerry Sandusky was not gay, but that is the the back mythology that drives that policy, and that's why it's important that the scouts drop that policy because it's it's a lie. Well, I was also going to say that, of course, you you have to believe in a higher power to be a scout too. We've had some famous yeah. like Eagle Scouts that had to walk out due to because when it was found out that they didn't believe right. in higher power, which is exactly the same joke applies. Yeah. So if you have a an atheist scout leader, mm -hmm. somehow we're going to in, in fact, the kids with the atheist agenda. Right. Yeah. Um, I think the, the direction that we want to go on that and dealing with and addressing religion is to to let everybody, let our scouts know about all the religions. We want to show them respect for all religions and all beliefs. That would include secular beliefs, atheism, uh, humanism. Well, that I requires think, a little bit more awareness than these people have. Yes, I mean, but here's I, a good example. I, I took my kids to uh, I took my kids to a Hindu temple. Uh huh. I, I'm taking to a, like a Christian to to a Buddhist temple and that too. But I mean, I took them to this, this Hindu temple, and then a couple of days later, 
I took him to a, a, a grocery store where it has, or some kind of store that has like the the little incense things on the mm -hmm. on the rack, which is you, you, I guess it was like a dollar store. Right. But it, uh, one of the odd little things that they had as you as you going up to the register was incense, and there was a picture of Krishna. Uh -huh. And and so I pointed out to him, yes, hey, we just you know we were just at Hindu temple yesterday. There's a picture of Krishna. What a coincidence! And then somebody else in the grocery line asked me who Krishna is. So then I have to explain that you know, Krishna is this you know the Hindu version of Jesus essentially. But you know I'm, I talk about that you know, Krishna was this Hindu god and everything. As soon as she realizes that I'm talking about another god from another religion, she puts up her hand to stop me and says, "If it ain't from Jesus, it's of the devil." Yes. Exactly. Yeah, and so th these people even identify Muslims as atheists in the sense that they don't believe in Jesus. Right. Well, th they do, but how would they know? <laughs> yeah, right. I, I can see taking these young people and trying to teach them to learn, understand, and respect all religions and all philosophies. And I think that that could be something that would be very welcome in this day and age and in this society. Because, uh, like I said, 97% of the scout troops in Utah are LDS, and to, if, if a young man wants to go to a scout troop here, it's 45 minutes of basketball and 15 minutes of praying. They have nothing to do with scouts. So that's what we're working towards. Uh, we have about 20 people who have already applied to be scout leaders, and I think one of them is gay. Um, mm -hmm. We have a rabbi who wants to help out. And uh, the Salt Lake County Mayor wants to be one of our, our merit badge counselors. So the, the scouts here in Texas, I mean, to my experience, have been very overtly religious. Mm -hmm. you know, I've attended to a couple of scout meetings, and just the overt prayers and all that nonsense right. is enough to drive me out of the room. Right. I, I, I can't deal with it. But are you saying that now that the, the scouts have some new tendency that they're allowing non-believers in? They have not definitely. They have not specifically mentioned non-believers. This is addressing the uh, the policies they had of not allowing gay leaders in. Okay. And even at that, they're going to leave that up to the local organizations. So we are up against that here because the local organizations are very, very staunchly LDS. All right. Well, then I got two questions for you in the last couple, the last few minutes that we have mm -hmm. here. Uh, what you do regularly and what you'll be doing after this, uh, after this conference is over, what you'll continue to do after that, just so that people have an idea of what you're about in general. Uh, and then also, what realistic uh, you know, goal or expectation do you expect, both of your activities and also what you expect this, this organization to try to pull off, or what do you expect it might, what negative result do you expect from that? Uh, the negative result that I expect from that is not going to be negative, but we're, we're doing a big public education campaign. We want people to know who they are, what they do, and what they stand for. This is the organization that is responsible for these laws in Russia, the anti-gay propaganda laws, the anti-blasphemy laws. Those people were very, very uh, influential in those laws where people are going to jail and being fined for being gay or talking about it. This organization is responsible for that, so we want to do some public education to let people know that that's what their intentions are here as well. Uh, they try to infiltrate governments, and, and they had something to do with the, the laws in Uganda as well. Wow. And they're dangerous. And this is what the word is we've got to get out. Well, uh, Russia and Uganda have also... Uganda. <laughs> you and I both are pronouncing that incorrectly. Yeah. <laughs> but both of these, well, these yeah. countries have, have gone... Have have made some real atrocities here recently. But that's correct, and the yeah, World Congress of Families was right in the middle of it. Wow, and the and the other question that I asked about what you will be doing continuing on even after this, and what you're about just in general. We are just kind of we're a civil rights watchdog organization here in just Utah. We want <clears throat> most of our our work so far has been for LGBT rights, but we don't want to keep it that way. <clears throat> Excuse me. We need to move beyond that because we don't want to be, just be known as an LGBT rights group. Um, so we're keeping an eye on legislation and what our legislators are doing up on the hill, and we want to start working on getting some of the pernicious laws that we have here in Utah changed. In Utah, the schools can't talk about gays. Well, we need to change that. Wow. So that's what we are. Okay, and then you know, speaking for myself, in the, the closing statement, I would say that. You know, I had you on because when we started the Brahmin podcast, we wanted to do something that was progressive, that, that highlighted people that were taking action to try to improve things. Uh, and it's it's difficult to find. You know, there are a lot of people that, that 
only suggest people that are well outside of our range. You know, I'm not going to get Bernie Sanders on this on this podcast, for example. You know, there, uh, Lawrence Lessig is out of my league. You know, <laughs> but but they're about in various avenues who do various things, and we focus almost entirely on atheism because I mean that's the, the atheist community knows me, and so that's the kind of thing that I generally get. But like you were talking about, I don't want to be just about that. Right. You know, there's a lot of different issues that other people need to address that I would like to I would like to talk about. I would like to hear from other people, even if even if they're believers, it's okay as long as they realize there's a problem and there's a solution and they're doing something to fix it. So right. to my audience, I would say that if you know any of these people that we should be talking to, who should be getting some attention for the actions that they're taking, and it's somebody that I can actually get a hold of who can spend an hour with us on a Google Hangout, I would love to hear about those people and I'd love to talk to them. So, uh, Mark, did you have any closing statements? Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, say thanks for coming on. Mark, appreciate it. Um, next, next episode we're going to have uh, Professor Greg Robinson from Binghamton University. He's going to come on and talk about the changes in congressional redistricting. Uh, or gerrymandering. He's actually a guy that I grew up with and went to school with, um, and we've kept in touch over the years, and he's an American political science professor. I think it's going to be a good show. Okay, very good. Um, thank you for scheduling that. All right, and uh, I've got a couple of people we're going to try to show, throw up because we are trying to do that. We're trying to be a progressive show, and I want to, I want to talk to more people that are taking that kind of action. We're trying to do something about it. All right, so th thank you, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and close. Thank Anybody you. else have anything else to say? We're well, good. That's it. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. Good All night. Right. Thanks. Good night.